Let's continue exploring the universe within art and the art behind Redstone. I'm your host, Omledu, and in this episode, we're going to talk about logic gates and memory circuits. Now, I promise this is not as complex as it may seem. All it really is is a vernacular set of descriptions that comes from electrical engineering to help you verbalize and describe the behaviors of different types of circuits. Being able to put a name to the behaviors not only helps us to memorize these things, but can also allow us to share ideas in an easier way. So let's start off with logic gates. First, we'll quickly go over what each of these things are, then we'll go over some examples so that we can actually visualize what it's doing. Starting off, if we just have a redstone torch, since the torch will basically invert the signal from the input, this is also called a NOT gate, because if the lever is not on, the torch will be, and vice versa. Next up, if you have multiple inputs on the same redstone line, this is called an OR gate, because if either the left lever or the right lever or both levers are activated, the output will also be. So it adds the statement OR into the machine. Now if we add a NOT gate to an OR gate, we have a NOR gate, or a NOT OR gate. And all this is is a torch that inverts the signal at the end of a line with multiple inputs. So if the left lever, or the right lever, or both levers are activated, the output will NOT be. Next up, we have an AND gate. So there's a torch back here that can only turn on if both of the other torches are turned off. So this adds the statement AND into the machine, because the left input AND the right input will need to be turned on in order for the output to be turned on. And all of these levers can be replaced with a button or a pressure plate, just levers are easy to visualize exactly what's happening. So like here, as long as the lever AND the button are activated, the output will also activate. If we remove the torch on the back side, we now have a NOT AND gate, or an IN AND gate, because these torches are still inverting the input. So if the left lever AND the right lever are active, the output will NOT be. Next up, we have one of the fancier gates. This is called an XOR gate. The X in the XOR basically excludes if both inputs are activated. Whereas with a regular OR gate, if any combination of any of the inputs are activated, the output will also be. But an XOR is either OR. It's either the left input or the right input, but not both of them. And of course, we can invert this gate as well simply by adding a torch to one of the inputs. So now it is an IN XOR gate, or a NOT XOR gate. This means that if either the left lever or the right lever are activated, then the output will NOT be. But if both levers are turned on or turned off, then the output will be on. But that's it for logic gates. Now the AND and the XOR are a little fancy, they do unique things, but in general, logic gates is just a way to describe the behavior of the redstone. Now let's talk about memory circuits. So these are a little less descriptive and more about accomplishing a certain task. More specifically, the storing of data. So something like turning a button into a lever so that the machine can remember how many times the button has been pressed or by using a counter such as a dropper to see how many times it has been activated. And there are basically five different categories that we can boil these down into. We have set, which will set the machine to on, Reset, which will reset the machine to off. Toggle, which will toggle the machine between on and off. And then we have data and clock, which go hand in hand. The data is the information that you want the machine to remember. And then clock checks the data to see what the data is. And this is clock not as in a repeating signal, but as in how a radar will clock the speed of a moving object. It will check to see what that speed is. So there's two different types of clock. For memory circuits, it's a check. But the generic use for clock is like a watch, something that has a repeating signal that is constant. But let's start off with the RS latch. So this has the R and the S. So the S sets the machine to on, and the R resets the machine to off. So there are two separate inputs that have two completely different functions. Pressing the set button multiple times will just constantly set the machine to on. It will never turn the machine off or do anything else. Whereas a T-flop has a T input, which stands for toggle. So no matter how many times you activate the input, it will always toggle it between on and off. And T-flop is just a shortened way to say T flip-flop. Next up, we have a D latch or a data latch. This has a data input and a clock input. Essentially, this uses the locking mechanics of repeaters in order to store data. 
So if the data is on, and then it is clocked, the data will be locked to on until the clock checks again to see what the data is. So once the clock is activated, changing the data won't actually change the output. And for this design, turning off the clock will immediately change the output to match the data. And then turning back on the clock will lock that data into place. But in that design, since the data toggles the output immediately, unless the clock is activated, the clock is functioning more as a lock than as a checking device. Whereas this design is a D-latch with a rising edge. This gives more function to the clock. The clock checks to see what the data is and gives you the corresponding output. Toggling the data will never change the output until the clock makes its check. And then once it makes its check, that data is locked into place. So changing the data after the clock has checked does nothing until the clock checks again. Just remember that memory circuits can remember the data. Like even a T-flop, something that we're all familiar with, it remembers if you pushed the button and how many times the button has been pressed because it turns the button into a static on or a static off, similarly to how input stabilization works. So this will stabilize a button and give you a static on, thus turning a pulse into a static on until it is turned off by some other input. So technically, this has the same function as an RS latch. You have one input that sets the machine to on, regardless of what that input is, and then it stays on until the reset input is activated to reset the machine to off. So an RS latch is also an input stabilizer. In this same category, we have extenders and shorteners. An extender will extend the active duration of a pulse so that it stays on for a longer amount of time, whereas a shortener will shorten the duration of the pulse so that it turns off faster in a shorter amount of time. And this is the inverse of an input stabilizer because it will take a static on and turn it into a pulse. And then you can extend the duration of the pulse by increasing the delay on the repeaters or by adding more repeaters. So these describe the duration of the signal, whereas logic gates describe the behavior and memory circuits describe the data, how it can be stored and interacted with. But now onto some examples so that we can visualize what we've talked about. So if you have multiple inputs on the same line, this is an OR gate because the door will open if the left button or the right button or both are activated. Adversely, if you want the door to open when you activate two different inputs at the same time, you can use an AND gate because the button will only work if the button and the lever are activated. This is also an easy way to make a door lock. The lever will be the door lock, and the button will try to open the door, but only if the door is unlocked. Now technically, if you think about it, we usually use a NOT gate underneath doors anyway, so that the redstone torch can shove power up into the door. But in this case, if we want a light to turn on when the door is closed, we can simply add a NOT gate by adding a redstone torch. And of course, we can combine all of these together in any combination. We can have OR gates attached to AND gates, invert them into NOTs, for whatever it is that we're trying to do. Now, as I'm sure we've all experienced, trying to use levers on the inside and the outside of a door doesn't work very well. This is technically an OR gate, but since the lever is not accessible from the outside or inside or vice versa, we can use an XOR gate to actually make this work. Because the XOR will ignore when both levers are on or when both levers are off, this actually works for a door. You can have a lever on the outside of a building and on the inside and not only can you open the door with either lever, but you can also close the door with either lever. Because the door will only receive power when a single lever is activated. The levers actually end up locking each other if they're both on at the same time. Now, a lot of the times that you come across XOR gates, they are built in this fashion, in kind of an X shape, with three torches on the back and two on the front here, next to the inputs. And this works in the exact same way. The output will only activate if the left lever or the right lever are active, but not if both of them are. And this is exactly the same as the design that we looked at earlier, except that it's built in a more three-dimensional space, so it makes it a little harder to look at and demonstrate. One unique property about this style of XOR gate is that these torches back here are directly connected to the inputs, so we can actually differentiate between which input is triggering the machine you still have the shared output that only activates if either the left lever or the right lever is active, but not both. But you will also have a secondary output that matches 
which of the inputs are active. So not only can you have a shared function between the two, but you can also have a secondary function based on which input is triggering the machine. And there is just a ton of stuff that you can do with XOR gates. I would highly recommend playing around with them to get a feel for how they work. But moving on to the memory circuits. So if we want to have a door that has two separate inputs, one that will open the door and keep it open, and then another set that will close the door and keep it closed, we can use an RS latch. And best of all, this is really easy to visualize since there are just two different pistons. One of the pistons is the set piston, and the other one is the reset. So we can run as many inputs as we want to to each of these pistons, from the front or from the back, and they will all function the same. Another unique thing about using an RS latch is if you use a lever, it will lock the RS latch into place. Since pistons cannot move extended pistons, this is a really easy way to lock the door open or closed. And now on to one of the most helpful circuits, the T-flop. Now I've talked about RS latches and T-flops many, many times, but it's because these are so useful for learning your redstone journey. They open up so many new doors, especially the T-flop. You know, you can run as many inputs as you want to to the T-flop, and all of them will function the same. They will all just toggle the T-flop between on and off. And just like an RS latch, you can use a lever to lock the T-flop into place. So whether the T-flop was set to on or set to off when the lever was activated, that is the position that it will now be locked into until the lever is no longer active. So a single lever can lock the door into both positions, whereas using an RS latch, the lever can only be connected to one or the other. Another super easy way to make a door locking mechanism is by using a D latch. So the data input is the button, and this just opens the door. But the clock input will lock the data into place. So since we're using a button, the data will usually be set to off, thus locking the door closed. But if we press them both at the same time, where the clock clocks the data while the data is active, it will now lock the data into place, leaving the door open until the clock is turned off. Now using a button on a regular D-latch is not very functional for the D-latch itself, but it is very functional for a door to have a locking mechanism. But with a D-latch, you know the button is basically always going to have an off data, so the clock is going to always clock it to off unless you press both at the same time. Whereas using a D-latch with a rising edge is not the best door mechanism, but it is a way more competent data mechanism. So on this one, the data input is what's actually locking and unlocking the door. Whereas on the previous one, the clock input is the thing locking and unlocking the door. On the rising edge version, the clock is technically what is toggling the door between open and closed. The data just predetermines if the door should be open or closed, but the door doesn't change until the clock checks the data. So really, using the rising edge as a door mechanism doesn't really work all that well, because you would need access to the data and the clock input from both sides of the door. You know, but it's just nice to have an example that we can tell what is supposed to happen. But you can also have multiple inputs that are going to the clocking part. You know, as long as those inputs turn off that redstone torch, you can clock the data from anywhere that you want to. And there is another important D-latch to know that doesn't really work with the door at all. That's because this is a low-level D-latch that will retain the signal strength of the data. So this gold pressure plate is the data. So if we stand on it and we clock it, we can see that it locks the signal strength of the data into place. So because we're using a gold pressure plate, it only has a strength of one. But if we throw more items onto the gold pressure plate, it will increase the signal strength of the data. Then if we turn off the clock, the output will then match the data. And then if we turn back on the clock, it will lock that data into place. So we still have a signal strength of three because the clock has clocked the data at a signal strength of three. So this is a really interesting way to be able to save the signal strength of the data. But now let's go over some examples of counters. So these count the number of activations. So we have a dropper attached to a not gate, which is a redstone torch. So when the comparator is not active and the dropper is empty, the torch will turn on and activate the door. So in this case, we have three items in the dropper. So after three activations, the door will open. Now, of course, since this dropper is just pooping items into a chest, you would have to return those items by hand. But we can use hoppers to automatically return the items back into the dropper. 
So here we have a dropper that's going to require five activations. So also for this design, we need to lock the hopper so it doesn't move the items back into the dropper until we're ready. But same way, the dropper is connected to the output through a NOT gate. So when the comparator is NOT on, the output will be. And then we have a clock to just constantly ping the dropper. So after the dropper has been activated five times, we will receive an output. And then we can just unlock the hopper to reset the items back into the counter. So counters can count activations or they can count other things. And then to make them fully automatic, you can do something like this. So we still have a clock, we have a hopper, but this hopper is being locked by an RS latch. And the latch is being controlled by the dropper and the hopper. So the dropper becoming empty is what sets the machine to on, giving you an output. And then when the hopper is empty, that will reset the RS latch back to off, which will then lock the hopper again. So if we turn on the counter, we can see that after it counts the correct number of items, we will then receive an output activation. And then it will start draining the items back into the dropper, and it will start the counting process all over again. So this is an example of using an RS latch, two NOT gates, a clock, and a counter, all to achieve a specific type of activation. And this is why it can be really helpful to break all of these mechanics down into smaller named categories describing behavior. Because you're not building one big complex machine, you're building it out of teeny tiny components. And last but not least, let's cover some examples that use the duration modifiers. So here we have a signal stabilizer that will take a pulse and turn it into a static on. So again, this is just like an RS latch. We have one button that sets the machine to on and leaves it on until the reset button is activated. So just like two pistons in a redstone block, this is technically an RS latch and vice versa. You know, activating the set will set the machine to on until you activate the reset to turn the machine off. And just like we mentioned with the RS latches, one benefit is that you can have as many inputs as you want to attached to the set and the reset. You know, any of the set inputs will turn the machine on and leave it on, and then any of the reset inputs will just turn the machine off. Now, one difference between using comparators compared to pistons is that the comparators are doing this because they don't degrade the signal strength. So it creates a loop without ever degrading the signal strength. Whereas using a piston and a redstone block, it's more obvious what's happening because the piston is just physically moving the redstone block and the redstone block is just always active. And so to turn off the comparators, rather than physically moving an object, you have to subtract signal strength by sending a signal into the side of a subtraction mode comparator. And this is also how an extender works is that the comparators are just slowly degrading the signal because there is a second dust coming out of one of the comparators. Now I've also been asked how you stabilize or extend a one tick pulse, such as from an observer. Because using the traditional extender or stabilizer just doesn't work. You know, it just freaks out and ends up creating a clock. But all we have to do is add a repeater with at least a two tick delay coming off of the one tick input. And that will stabilize it so that you can then either extend it or just fully stabilize it into a static, depending on what you want. And so again, all we have to do is have a repeater on a two tick delay, and that will increase it to be long enough so that it doesn't freak out. And then if we want to stabilize this into an RS latch or to an output stabilizer, all we'd have to do is add an extra block so that both comparators are pointed into a block. And then to turn this off, of course, we need a subtraction mode comparator to run power to. And that's it. So just remember that all of this terminology is simply breaking down behaviors into its smallest forms and then labeling them with a name so that it's easier for you to remember. That way, whenever you're building something, you're not building this giant complicated machine all at the same time. You're actually building it out of teeny tiny individual components. So when you run into a problem, knowing some of this terminology or how some of these things work will give you simple solutions to complex problems. And not only that, but it will help you articulate and to visualize how to solve these problems. But that's all we got for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like, favorite, share, and subscribe, and be sure to leave a comment. Let me know what you did or didn't like, or if you have any questions or requests, I will do my best to help you out. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Until then, I've been your host, Amala Du, sharing a redstone trick or two, and reminding you, as always, don't forget to have fun. Bye-bye.